This is Melina Lee Williams Haas. I deeply appreciate you listening and taking the time to hang out with me. I will be addressing issues of life, the universe, and everything that are often bogged down and mired in shame and grief, and talk about how they can be repackaged to be useful and gorgeous and fucking awesome for you. So, sit back and relax, or, you know what? Sit up and freak out. However, you prefer to listen. Let's go. I started and stopped this episode five or six times, and it fooled me. I had the idea because people frequently ask me about what it was like to be an actor as a kid. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll tell about when I was between the ages of probably about six and 12. And I did a lot of commercial work, a lot of film and TV work. I'll talk about that. That'll be kind of cool. But it kept dragging up less sunny and delightful memories. And so I kept putting it off and I kept thinking, okay, I should do something else. And then nothing else presented itself. One of the things I have discovered for myself in my life is when I hit a wall and I procrastinate, my first impulse is to think of myself as lazy or incompetent or stupid or avoidant or any number of really derogatory phrases that I utilize against myself with alarming frequency. And I try to do less of that, but the reality is it's part of my struggle in recovery from alcoholism is the self-esteem thing and attributing anything that does not fit the standard American capitalist model of excellence, right? Working many hours a week for someone else usually, right? So I like to blame myself for everything that maybe isn't something that needs to have blame directed at it. I'll be 53 in a month and a half or so. What month is this? It's the end of mid-April, mid-April, mid-May, mid-June. So two months. I'll be 53. And that's not an insignificant amount of time. And what that means to me when I look back on my childhood is the world in which I was living when I was a child was a very different world than the one we're living in right now. And trying to adjust my mindset to that world in order to tell the story well and accurately is very difficult. And I kept stalling around it. And I realized that part of the reason I was stalling around it is that I like to share stories that have a positive outcome. I like to share stories where the dream comes true or by perseverance, you see your way through, or even if you don't get things exactly right, you can see how it benefited you. You can see where you grew from it. You can see where things are better. And this is a situation where it's harder for me to see that. I was born June 20th, 1969 to two very young parents. And when I was probably about three or four years old, my father gave me a boxed set of the Chronicles of Narnia as a growing up gift. It was something that maybe, you know, they could read to me at bedtime, stuff like that. The day after Christmas, I came back to my parents and I said, okay, I've read this first one. Can I have the next book, please? And they laughed and said, okay, well, first of all, she's, you know, three and a half. There's not reading. And also there's no way you read a book in a day. And so I proceeded to tell my mom exactly what the story of the book was. And she hadn't read it. So she was like, okay, maybe she's making up a thing about talking lions and children climbing into closets and bad witches and talking animals, but I'll see you when her dad gets home because he's read it. Dad got home. Story was repeated. He's a little stunned because he's like, well, that's, that is the book, but she can read that fast. So they gave me the next book and then my father and I talked about it and they were a little surprised because I guess that's pretty precocious. A couple of weeks later, my mom had taken me to work with her and I was sitting at a little stool and a tiny table next to her desk. She worked for a design firm. They were called J-Rod Studios. They were down, I think they were actually in the Flatiron Building for a short period of time. I remember going into those offices and they were really cool looking. Anyway, I had a copy of the New York Times, which was at the time about as large as I was. And I was reading it and 
one of my mom's coworkers came by and said, oh, look how cute. She thinks she can read the paper. My mom said, well, actually, yeah, she can read. And they asked me to read a little bit from the paper and I did. And they were shocked and stunned. And then they were like, well, read this, read that. So of course, me being a little baby attention hoe was like, of course, I will read all of the things. By this time, there was a little crowd gathered around my mom's desk and they were like, what are you going to do with this kid? She's like, I have no idea because, of course, who knew what to do with this kid? And one of my mom's managers came over and was like, what's going on here? And I was reading an article about President Nixon and a spot of trouble that he'd gotten himself into. I was this? I don't I think this was before Watergate. Yeah, it was definitely before Watergate because I think that was later. But there was something he had done and people were very upset. And so I read a piece of the article and my mom's boss was standing there with his mouth open and turned to my mom and said, "Okay, well, she can read the words, but what's her? I mean, does she know what she's saying? Because, you know, white men can't ever let you be great. And my mom said, "Okay, Mo, what does this mean? And I look up and I said, it means that President Nixon is an idiot and no one should trust him. And the entire office like lost their minds and were just like, oh, my God, she's amazing. Yeah. And one of my co- my mom's co-workers, this guy named Tony, who was delightful and amazing and wonderful. And the first gay grown up that I had coming up as a friend, one of my first grown up friends. And he said to my mom, he's like, you have to get her in front of a camera. This kid's amazing. And my mom's like, well, I, I don't even know how to do that. I don't know if she would want to do that. And I'm like, I want to do it. I want to be famous. I'm going to be an actor. How can I do it? And he said, well, I actually have a friend who's an agent, Norma Belsky. Let me get you guys a meeting with her. And so we did. And I went to Norma Belsky's office. I believe it was 50, 53rd, maybe. And had a meeting with her. And she was like, you're hired, kid. And she started sending me out on calls immediately. And I was so excited because this would have been my dream. <laughs> For all of, you know, like maybe a year and a half, I will explain that my father took us to see the revival of the original cast of the musical Hair, which is running on Broadway. Appropriate for a toddler, two, three-year-old? Probably not. However, I will never forget standing on my seat, jumping up and down and clapping as my mom frantically tried to keep me from tumbling backwards as the cast came out at the end and they're naked, covered in Dago paint and singing, let the sun shine in and running around the audience. And it was such a joy and such a freedom. And when we were leaving the theater, I told my parents, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be an actor. And I was so excited that now I got to do it right now. I didn't even have to wait till I was a grown up because all the shit that they tell you that's going to be awesome in your life. They also tell you, you have to wait till you're grown up to do it. And I was like, well, this I can start doing now. They need kids as actors. So I'm going to do this. And I did. And I started going on auditions very quickly and I started landing jobs pretty quickly as well. One of the first jobs that I remember getting was a commercial for Mrs. Paul's fish sticks. And I love fish sticks. So I was very excited. I was like, I get to eat fish sticks all day and talk about them. Well, lesson number one in doing commercial work, any commercial that involves food is going to quickly become a dystopian nightmare for the actors involved. And the reason is food in the wild is not perfect. Food in the wild has irregular clumps on it. Food in the wild is unevenly heated or weird or doesn't glisten properly in the lights or melts or falls apart. And that is not acceptable for the commercial palette. So food for commercials has its own stylist. There are people who are on the set whose jobs it is solely to make that food look nice for the cameras, to make it hold up under the lights, to make hundreds of them that are the same so that there's no continuity problem. If you have one burger for one shot and then a reverse angle with the same burger and there's only one tomato, God forbid. The problem is, while their job is to make the food look good, that has nothing to do with the palatability of the food. Because the food that you're going to be eating is probably not going to be the food that they're preparing because they are doing all manner of shit to that food, okay? I will tell you, for example, these Mrs. Paul's fish sticks, 
the ones that were on camera weren't even really fish sticks. They were breaded lumps of something else, or rather, I don't even know, that were adhered to and rolled in glue so that the crumbs wouldn't crumble and fall off and fuck up the plate. Now, there were a couple of real fish sticks that we were to take bites of, but those had been cooked at 4 or 5 a.m. And by the time we started filming at 7 or 8 a.m., they were quite cold. And those were just bites that we were to take in the cutaway shots. Filming a commercial is a grueling process. And on average, it will take you an entire day to shoot what is 15 to 30 seconds of footage. An entire day. Hundreds of takes. And the reason for that is everything has to be entirely, completely perfect to the vision of the producers and the director. And so what that means for you as an actor who is taking a bite of these delicious fish sticks and then turning to the camera and giving Mrs. Pauls the thumbs up is that immediately after the director yells cut, you have to eject that cold wad of chewed fish out of your mouth into the spit bucket, which is hidden cleverly out of camera range. And then they will reset the plate and you will go again and again and again and again. Now, I, of course, was a tiny professional actress, so of course I was amazing, but not all kids, A, wanted to be there, B, knew what the fuck to do once they were there, and C, had the good grace to remain chill through hours three, four, five, six, seven of shooting. So you got to imagine, you know who I really wonder about? I wonder about the adults who had to work with kids on these sets. What a fucking nightmare that must have been. So... So that shoot was kind, of, was kind of fun at first, but then the smell of the fish sticks that we had to eat started to get to me. And I started kind of gagging a little bit every time I had to take a bite, which of course is gonna read. So the director was like, okay, honey, I need you to smile. I need you to be cheerful about the fish sticks. And you're like, okay, forget that they're cold and they're gross. Just smile, eat the fish sticks, spit it out, cut. Thanks, Mrs. Paul's cuts. Next plate, smile, bite the fists, and roll, action, speed. Thanks, Mrs. Paul, cut, and action. Okay, too much bounce in the voice, I need your voice to be more even. Okay, sorry, that's okay. And roll, speed, go. Thanks, Mrs. Paul, cut, shift the plate for hours and hours and hours. But I remember the first time being at home when I saw myself on TV and I was screaming and jumping up and down and how, how amazing that was. And then how cool it was to go to school the next day and have kids say, I saw you on TV. I saw your commercial and be like, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> there were one or two other kids in my school who were also uh, film and TV and theater kids. And occasionally we would have that sort of casual like, oh, yeah, I got to go. I got an audition kind of thing when we had to bolt out of school in the middle of the afternoon last minute. One of the commercials that garnered me the most traction was a commercial for Orbit Bubblegum. The commercial was myself and I think four or five other little kids and a quote unquote robot because Orbit, space age, robot, right? singing this little jingle about Orbit Bubblegum. It's new, it's Orbit. And then we would march around and sing. And what was hilarious is that there was one point in the commercial where we all had to blow a bubble and the robot also was supposed to blow a bubble. And they had rigged a line with an air gun and they had wads of chewed up bubblegum and they kept trying to stick it on this little hole and get the robot to blow bubbles, which you can imagine had very mixed effects. And it constantly wasn't working and it wasn't working and it wasn't working. And I finally said to my mom, they should just put a balloon in there. No one would see it. And they should know. My mom's like, you should tell the director that. And I said to the director, why don't you use a balloon instead of bubble gum? You could get a pink balloon and just blow it up that way. And the director looked at me as though I had three heads and turned to one of the crew and was like, get a fucking balloon. <laughs> and he shook my head and he hand and he was like, thanks, kid. And so they got a balloon and they worked it out <laughs> with a cut so that you couldn't really see the bubble starting and see that it was already existing uh, as a balloon. That Orbit Bubblegum commercial was, I think it might've been one of the first national level commercials that I did. And I'll explain the system. Now, I don't know, the system may have changed in the intervening four, five decades, but when I was a kid, there were commercials that were shot for local, regional, and then national. 
Local meant that it would only be shown in your city or your town, like a little small car dealership, et cetera. You would see those local commercials. So for example, if you grew up in New York, Crazy Eddie would be an example of a local commercial because Crazy Eddie stores were only in New York, I believe. New York, in the boroughs, I think maybe. Regional would be something like an area where you had a chain. So for example, I did a commercial for Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor, which was, I believe, throughout the Northeast and down to the South, maybe. And so that part of the country would see these commercials, but the rest of America wouldn't because there were no Farrell's there. So occasionally I would do commercials for products I had never heard of. I did a commercial for Sunshine Bread, which was only distributed in the South. Never saw a package of Sunshine Bread in my life, but I made money selling it, which was super great. And then you had national commercials, which were for brands or for chains or for objects or things or goods or services that were sold across the country. So these would be sold to national networks. And these were what you wanted to land. The national commercials made you exponentially more money than any of the other commercials did. So when you got a national, that was a big fucking deal. Mrs. Paul's Fish Sticks, for example, that was a national commercial because they were sold all over the U.S., Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor, Sunshine Bread were not national commercials because not sold everywhere. Orbit Bubblegum, a national commercial. Really great because then you made more money. The reason this was important for me, a six-year-old kid, was because I came from a poor family. Came the day at one point when my mom and my dad were uh, separating and my mom didn't have a lot of money and came to me very tearfully and said, Mo, I hate to ask this, but Do you think it would be okay if we use some of your money now and I'll pay you back later, but so that we can find a place on our own? And I was so excited because unlike apparently the majority of children, I really wanted my parents to get divorced because my mother was so unhappy with my father. And while I thought my father was really great, he and my mom did not have a good relationship. It was clear to me. And I knew we would be better off just on our own, doing our own thing. And me and my mom, we could do it. I could do my commercials and go to school and and she could work her job and then we'd be all right. My producer, Cody Crabb, is a fucking rock star, okay? I have loved working with him for the past few months and I cannot recommend him highly enough. Some of you out there listening are probably thinking, you know, I've always wanted to do a podcast, but I can't, yeah. It sucks, all right? All the production stuff sucks, but there are people out there who like that suckiness, and this mofo is one of them. Here's what I'm gonna do. People of color to the front especially, but I'm extending this offer to my friends and peeps and listeners. If you've been sitting on a podcast idea and you're like, I just don't, I don't, I don't but I need help and I can't, and it's so much, here's what I'm gonna do. You click on the link below in the show notes, you make an appointment with Mr. Crab. Mr. (laughs) Crab, I'm sorry, I just go full SpongeBob every time I think of this. You make an appointment with him. He has very easy ways to have a consultation with him. Just give him a chat. Tell him your ideas. See what you think. If you decide to book a a series with him, just an, an opening gambit of three episodes, you can get the fourth one for free. So you do three episodes, fourth one's on me. I'm covering it for you. And I especially want to hear from people of color who have been sitting on a podcast idea for a while, come through. The world needs to hear from you. The world needs more of us. And I would love to be here for you to help you get that little last step, that little last, uh, that little, yeah, go do it, go do it. So click on the link, make the appointment, check it out. Join me in podcast land, y'all. Come through, come through. So that first little chunk of money that had made doing commercial work was spent to get us into a new apartment and we were on our own and I was so happy and so excited until it was discovered that, well, now my mom and my dad were going to get back together. And by the way, my mom was pregnant. Now, I'm not sure in what order these things happened. And of course, no one remembers. But they got back together. I was not thrilled. I was not happy, mostly because we had spent a lot of money to go and try to live on our own. And now we were just erasing all of that. But it was okay because the family was together and I would make more money. And I did. And I did more commercials. I did some film and TV work. Um, I will tell you, this is hilarious. And you can actually fact check this. 
I got a call one day to be an extra in a new movie that was filming. It was going to be an all black version of The Wizard of Oz. And there were going to be all these famous black actors and singers and performers in it. I was so excited. And the first day that we were filming, they had too many extras. So we got to the set and after sitting around for a while, they just let a lot of us go. However, they also had a second set of auditions for people to sing on the soundtrack. So while I wasn't invited back for the next day of standing around to be an extra in the Emerald City sequence, I did an audition and I did wind up being chosen for the children's chorus. So we were in the studio for the next week and I will tell you, my memory is crap, but you can go and look up all the names of all the folks who were singing in the musical, the movie, The Wiz. And I got to meet them. I got to meet most cool. Diana Ross came in and signed autographs for us. Nipsey Russell. Oh my gosh. Lena Horne, who was Glinda the Good. I, I guess she was she Glinda. Was she, is that who she was? Anyway, she sings If You Believe in the movie. And in the sequence where she is talking to Dorothy, you can hear in the background these little voices singing, the star babies. And in the movie there, the star babies are played by actual babies, but myself and four other little kids actually sang the star babies. That was the intro for Lena Horn singing. And we did get to see Lena Horn in the studio singing as well. I can tell you it was one of the most amazing weeks of my life. Side note, who did not come and give us autographs or meet with us despite us trying was Michael Jackson, who just literally refused to come and see us, even though everyone else had come in that day. And we were like, well, forget you then. And so whatever. <laughs> so there's my memory of almost meeting Michael Jackson. Saw him through the studio window, declined to come in and sign autographs for us, even though everyone else had. So screw that guy or unscrew that guy. I also did a radio commercial for a Patti LaBelle album and got to meet Patti LaBelle, uh, which my mom lost her mind. I was like, Patti LaBelle, okay, whatever. But my mom was like, oh my gosh, Miss LaBelle. She was so excited. It was amazing. And as I continued to work, I had so many really amazing adventures and some of them were really kind of cool. I did a, an episode of The Equalizer, I think. And I can't remember the name of the actor who was in that, Edward. Richard, something, some British guy. But this episode was shot in the Museum of Natural History. Now, of course, typically businesses will not close all the way down for shoots unless you're paying a lot of money. And to close down an entire museum is too much money. So this was shot on one of the days the museum was closed and was shot mostly at night, starting the night before through to the day of, which meant that myself and about 20 other kids had the run of the Museum of Natural History when it was closed. It was so fucking cool. I'm sure it was terrible for the crew because like during our breaks, they were supposed to wrangle us over to have our lunch break or dinner break or whatever. And we were like, see ya. And I was like, I need to go see the room with the blue whale. Let me tell you, being in the room with the huge whale, when almost all the lights are out except the emergency lights and you just see this huge figure hovering above you. And you can imagine maybe you really are in the ocean and this whale is just swimming silently through the water above you. And then looking into all of those scruffy dioramas, but now they actually are kind of mysterious because you have to lean your nose and face up against the glass and peer into the darkness to see the cheetahs and the water buffalo staring at you with their glassy eyes in the darkness. That was an amazing night. <laughs> Less amazing was the fact that this was the 70s and then into the 80s. And so the idea of maybe leaning back against the unions was something that was done fairly frequently. There were rules as to how long children were supposed to work on set, but there were also people with a lot of money whose best interest it was not in to let us work for only seven and a half hours or whatever it was. So there would frequently be these conversations as time was growing late where the parents would be called over and they would say, well, we're hitting the budget. I'm hitting the, sorry, we're hitting the, um, the union limit, but we can pay you double time if you just sign this waiver. And of course, all the parents were like, well, I thank you because double time meant more money. And that's really the reason we were all here, wasn't it? So every once in a while, there would be a situation where we would be working obnoxiously late. 
the Orbit commercial that I mentioned earlier with the faulty robot was one of those because the first half of the day was spent with failure after failure until I brilliantly saved the day. You're welcome. But that meant that we were going very late. And by the time we left, it was after midnight. And my father had to come and pick me up because my mom had to go. At, by that time, she was dealing with my youngest sister. And so she had to go and take care of the baby. She had to pick up the baby from the babysitter. So my father came onto the set because he had to have a, have a parent there. And then my dad wound up having to take me home on the train. Now, keep in mind, uh, this was the spring. So, and the costume I was wearing was like this little tiny, vanishingly short mini skirt, a little jumper, a little sweater thing. But because I had just come off of a commercial set, I had a face full of makeup on, which becomes blindingly obvious when you are out of camera lights, right? And so my dad was taking me home at maybe like 12, 30, 1 a.m. And here I am, a little kid wearing a mini skirt and this little crop top, full face of makeup, hair did, everything like that, on the train in the middle of the night. And I'll never forget looking up at my dad, who was oblivious, reading his little book or whatever, and saw these three women staring at me, staring at my dad, looking back and forth and whispering among themselves. And here's the thing. I'm a New York kid, so I'm aware that bad shit happens to kids. And I'm aware of what this must look like. And I immediately am like, oh, no, they think my dad is some sort of, oh, no. So I immediately started talking really loudly about the commercial. I was like, oh, dad, I'm so glad we're finally going home after shooting for so many hours. He's like, yeah, that was a long time. And so we had this conversation. And I think eventually the lady sort of backed down when I kind of included them in the conversation. I was like, I'm an actor. I just did a commercial. And they were like, oh, you did, <laughs> which probably didn't seem much like a cover story because then we had a whole conversation about it. And I remember thinking, "Woo! I wonder what would have happened if they'd gotten off the train and called the police on my dad. Awkward. <laughs> but I did really well because this was like the 70s and it was actually pretty cool to be a little black kid. Advertisers had finally figured out that we had money and we spent it on things as well. And so I did quite well. I was doing a, a few jobs a, a month, actually, at the height of the career there. And I was a member of the Screen Actors Guild and a member of AFTRA. I was in three different unions at one point and doing really well. And this was terrific because it meant that when we hit a hard time, the money that I was making was able to come in and save the day on more than a few occasions. And I was really proud that I was able to do that and able to help out. The thing is that the older you get, you start to hit this point where maybe you're not quite as cute. <laughs> so you got to shift gears. And my agent started sending me out for different calls. She sent me out for one call that she said was for a show. And usually with a show, you have to do what's called a cold read. So they give you a script, you look at it, you read it, and then they see if they want to call you back. What she hadn't told me, I don't know if she knew, was that this was a musical that I had been called in for. And so I was to have had prepared a song and I did not. And I walked in there and they were like, OK. And the accompanist is like, do you have your music? And I'm like, my what? And they're like, oh, honey, no, this is you have to have a piece prepared. And I was like, oh, OK, sorry, they didn't tell me. And I walked out and my father's like, what happened? And I said, well, I needed to have a song prepared. He's like, well, go sing a song. Now, here's the thing. My mother would have said, OK, fine, and walked out and said, sorry, we weren't prepared. Too bad. My dad didn't really like to hear no. And so we went outside the building and stood in an alley around the corner while he decided what song I was going to sing. And I said, I can't do it, dad, I can't. And he's like, well, you don't have to sing it. You can just speak it along like Rex Harrison <laughs> in The Music Man. And I was horrified, but I didn't know what else to do. So I walked back in and I said, OK, I'd like to try again. And the folks at the desk were like, uh, OK, sure. And I walked back in and I started just sort of doing a recitative of this piece. And it was so awkward and so horrible. And inside I felt this hot, bulging wave of tears coming. And I could see just the pity on the face of the person running the audition. And she was like, it's OK, honey, thanks. Thank you for trying. You can go. Because I'm sure she knew what had happened. And I just ran out crying and it was pretty awful. And my father didn't take me to any more auditions after that. 
I did continue to do pretty well though. I had quite a few auditions. I had a few more national commercials. The money was coming in and going back out pretty much as fast as it came in. The last audition that I had with this agent was a big one. It was for a role on a soap opera. And it was to be like the daughter or the niece or someone of these two black characters. I can't, I don't know if it was all my children or one life to live. And I rocked this audition. Holy shit. I kicked the shit out of it and made it to the finals. It was down to me and one other little girl. She went first. And when I arrived, she was in doing her read and she came walking out and looked me up and looked me down and smirked and walked out. And we both knew that she had this role because she was pretty. She had perfect straight pressed hair and two ponytails that cascaded down her back and lovely, gorgeous, lemony, pale, light brown skin, just enough so you knew she was black, but not as dark as me and light brown eyes that just gave her this really sweet, wide-eyed look. And when we made that eye contact, it was that moment of knowing that the light-skinned girl is always going to get the role. But I said, you know what? Not today's the day I'm going to kick that girl's ass. And I walked in there, started joking around with the producers, immediately created that rapport. Because of course, as a brilliant and gifted kid, I could drop science and knowledge on them. And within 10 seconds, they were like, this kid's amazing. I rocked that audition and I still didn't get cast. And that was the last audition I had with that agent. And at that point I was in sixth grade. So I would have been almost 12. And at that point, the auditions sort of dropped off almost entirely. And I turned and decided that I was going to focus more closely on theater work and focus on getting ready to go to NYU because I was gonna grow up and be an actor. And that was my dream. And I did, I auditioned for NYU in the beginning of my junior year and I was accepted early. <laughs> and so my entire life fell right into place. So my second half of my junior year of high school and my senior year were just cruising, amazing, wonderful experiences till I got to NYU and my life had just fallen right into place. The track that I had envisioned for myself was in line until sophomore year. When the spring semester came and I opened up my financial aid package and the news that I had been seeing about the dissolution of the programs that were put in place to assist black students hit my bottom line. The affirmative action cuts that Reagan had implemented meant that the three scholarships that I was receiving that enabled me to afford NYU, which was expensive, had been cut. I ran to the financial aid office in a panic and they said, yeah, this impacts a lot of people and we're completely out of emergency funds. We have no way to help you. When I stood in front of the financial aid office, too empty and stunned even to cry because I realized that despite the fact that I was in the top 0.5% of students in the country in terms of my SAT scores and my grades and my IQ, none of that mattered because I was poor and I was black and I simply did not deserve to have a free education handed to me. Who did I think I was? And I told my mom and she said, well, God will provide. You'll see, it'll be okay. And then I sat and I thought to myself and I said, if even half of the money that I made doing these commercials had been set aside for me, I would have been okay. There's a very strange bitterness that comes from a loss that is not the fault of an evil person. My parents didn't squander this money on drugs or alcohol or gambling. They were struggling to survive. And yet I was so angry and so disappointed and had no place to put that anger and disappointment. Sure, the government, yes, but it was rough. I still struggle with that. I still have so many amazing memories of being a kid on these sets and meeting celebrities and then realizing that all of that 
still didn't feed my dream, ultimately. I did land on my feet. I sure did. At the time, I was volunteering for the Shakespeare Festival, and when I went and told my boss what had happened, she spoke to Joe Papp and made a job for me, and I wound up working full-time there for the next few years. And it was as good a job as one can want for a day job if you're an actor, right? The kid I was was amazing and resilient and brilliant and necessary. And part of me is that kid still working so hard to please other people. And that's okay. And part of me still carries a bit of resentment and sadness. And that is also okay. It's very hard to feel like I'm entitled to my emotions, especially the ones that are difficult or not pretty. But I am. And I'm so grateful for that history and for those stories. And I'm also disappointed and sad that I wasn't able to reap the benefits of the work that I did in the way that I wanted to. And that's all right. Thank you for listening. I love you. Please be kind to yourself, please. You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb. Theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas, as performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon. Mm-hmm.